I, uh, I originally started out uh, driving research ships around for NOAA. Um, one of my, uh, I spent two years on the on on Chesapeake Bay on a NOAA ship deploying uh, current current meters, and that's that's uh, ultimately what I did my dissertation on. And I was the head of uh, climate observations at NOAA, uh, basically in charge of the observing systems that keep track of how climate changes. And then that led to uh, uh, a three-year stint over in Geneva. The United Nations has a uh, an outfit called the Global Climate Observing System. So I ran that for, for three years in, in Geneva and sort of got a, a better global picture on it. Mm -hmm. But while I was at NOAA, um, I guess back in 91, I started commuting into um, the NOAA's offices in Silver Spring by bicycle. I see. And, um, and then I started reading, there are people that you know, ride ride these bikes for long distances, and I thought, well, that's that's fairly strange. And and I did did my first long bike ride out in uh, in I in Idaho and Montana in 2000. But my big thing was when I retired from NOAA in 2011. Uh, I I wanted to sort of do the big thing, which was to to ride across to Oregon. So I I live in in Rockville, so I had three days um, and rode uh, across to Rehoboth, sort of to cover the, the eastern part of it. And then on the 1st of May, uh, started across uh, solo with all the camping gear and everything um, from Rockville and ended up in, uh, in on the coast of Oregon three months later. Kind of got a lot of sense for, the, for history riding across. You just get a, a closer feel to things when you're on, on the bike. The first book, uh, A Hole in the Wind, uh, it's, it's actually this one, got one up there, um, was about the ride across the country and looking at climate from a, from a bicycle seat and the, the things that, that I would see uh, as a climate scientist and then looking at, uh, you know, what does this look like on the ground? Um, the, like one of the one of the surprises was, you know, on my metal bulletin board was crossing the Rockies, the, the front range. And when I got to the top of a place called Cameron Pass, um, I was, you know, absolutely blitzed, but I kind of look around and, and the trees are all dead. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all gray. And it's like, oh, this is, this is the mountain pine beetle, um, which uh, used to be there would only be one generation of bugs that could get through the year and the trees sort of had a defense for that. Mm -hmm. And as the winters got shorter and the, the warm season got longer, it got to where the bugs had two life cycles in the course of a year and, and the trees could not handle that. Um, and they're just big swaths of the West where uh, you know, where it's, it's beetle kill is the name of it. I sort of thought the, the two bookends for, um, the, uh, for the two books, I was looking at what climate change looks like going across the country. And then I was thinking, okay, where does it come from? And so I thought, uh, for starters, the, the, uh, the tar sands or the oil sands as the, the Canadians will quickly correct, correct you. Um, uh, certainly are very much in the news because it's the source region for the, uh, or is to be the source region for the Keystone XL pipeline. And, and then at the same time, there is a big um, field in the U.S. called uh, the Bakken in western North Dakota, which is one of the new frontier fields. And I thought, okay, um, these are two places where I could see um, where carbon is coming from the ground. And that there are uh, there are human stories that go along with it. There, but one of the things you see from there, is, and and the other thing that sort of drew me there was was that uh, from the air you see these there are these uh, tailings ponds or settling ponds that are some of the biggest man-made structures on the planet. The 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 uh, they're basically dammed up. There's uh, places where 
the water that they use to process the oil sands, um, you know, you can't dump it into the river. So it basically has to settle for, for periods of years. And uh, I, I think one of the big concerns is at some point, those man-made dams, you know, in some uh, big rainstorm are going to give way. Well, I think um, from my perspective as a climate scientist, there's, um, you know, there are a lot of bad things happening now that are related to um, our use of fossil fuels. So the uh, big international organizations, the, the, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, talks about that we've got about a decade to cut our fossil fuel use in half. And I really believe that it's something that we can do, um, that the oil companies have an enormous amount of power, but uh, one of the people that I discovered out there um, has fought, you know, fought the oil companies um, 120 years ago and won, and that, that person being Teddy Roosevelt. That um, it really was, there, part of the book is about the geology, that, that um, I was across an ancient ocean, um, and it was the ocean that made these two uh, these two oil deposits. So uh, the whole time I'm, I'm kind of thinking about where this was in geologic time and uh, and actually there's how it relates to climate change in the in the uh, in the paleoclimate era in the in the in the millions of years ago. So anyway